in, um, <clears throat> in, in the book of Revelation, you understand that the name of the book of Revelation is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it's all about Him. And uh, when John first is uh, <clears throat> uh, brought to heaven, <laughs> when the Lord says, come up here, John goes up to heaven, and this is his vision of what heaven is like. And chapters 4 and 5 are some of the more exciting chapters, at least, because it has to do with a view of the throne of God the Father and the uh, import of the mission <laughs> in this world of Jesus Christ from glory, where he is. And so, in Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, John says, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. That just means various shades of green. You may have noticed this in nature. Uh, how many shades of green are there in nature? Um, it's almost unbelievable how many greens there are. And of course, I know that's all due to the chlorophyll in the leaves of the plants and the sun doing its job to keep them alive. But I think green is just one of God's favorite colors. Maybe it's the favorite color. This, this, this rainbow that literally is around the throne is the color of emerald. And so around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Uh, mostly what you have in the book of Revelation is God the Father, um, God the Son, who looks is clothed as a lamb, he says. Uh, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, there is this person who you really can't realize because he appears in the book of Revelation um, not so much as a person, since he's a spirit, but he appears as these seven torches of fire. He's described that way in Revelation 1 and here as well. And so, <clears throat> although he's real, and his effect is real, he appears as these seven spirits of God. There's a reason for that. It's, by the way, explained by the Scriptures. But let us move along. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind the first creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And while I could make this description of these four beasts, uh, let, let it be known at least that when it comes to verse 8, um, they are surrounding the throne and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. They're around the throne. And they are continually proclaiming holiness. This is, you might say, um, a divine business card. It's a divine determination of what is God's character. It is holiness through and through. No doubt, no sin, no second thoughts. This is his character. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And who has always existed and always will exist, I've really taken us right out of our own territory, haven't I? We can't imagine this, but this is God. Now, it's important that you know these four beasts surround the throne. And, uh, and I'll get to that in just a minute. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They've got a tough job. They spend almost all the time on their face worshiping the Lord. 24 elders. I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, a lot, lot in Revelation is symbolic language, but don't let it fool you. The symbolic language is depicting real facts, real things, real God, real people, real things going on. And so these 24 elders are probably from the church of the Lord. Um, 
I know where he got more or less 12 apostles. <laughs> I don't know where the other 20, 12 were coming from, but nonetheless, he knows. Um, at the end of the book, you, you find the, the city, the new Jerusalem, and on its foundations are the names of the apostles, you remember. And um, uh, so in any case, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that Paul is in there somewhere, but that's just my thought. And so they're, they're on their knees worshiping him, and what they're saying is this. Look at verse 11 of Revelation 4. Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. By your will they existed and were created. That moves us into Revelation 5, and just bear with us now. Uh, keep reading. Um, it, it will not make you blind. Just keep reading Revelation 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, of course that's God the Father, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Hear that? Seven spirits of God again. Sent out into all the earth. Uh, you understand where he's standing. Uh, keep note of that. Between the throne of God, God's person, and the four living creatures who were out here surrounding the throne, I had four points, proclaiming, holy, holy, holy. The lamb, looking as if it had been slain. Now that doesn't mean he's bleeding on the sea of glass. It just simply means that he's standing there in this glorified body of a man with which he rose from the dead, you remember? And, and at, at Easter time. <laughs> and when he went on into, ascended on into heaven, he still has this body, you see, that was prepared for him by God. And so, between, however, the holiness of God, which is God's character, and these beasts yelling out his business card, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, stands a lamb slain. What does that mean? He has the holes, you understand, in his, in his hands, pro probably his wrists, and um, in his side, and in his ankles, and around his head, the marks of the thorns. Now, it doesn't mean he's bleeding. It just means he shows how he was put to death. He shows how he bled for our sins. So in that light, he is standing as a sacrificed lamb. I know this is capital L-A-M-B, but he's still standing there as one who was, in the second member of the Trinity, sacrificed for us and for our sins. So the holiness of God does not eat us alive when we try to move toward heaven, you understand. God's purpose is to intervene on our behalf for our sins, with the Lamb. So every which way he turns, when Satan accuses us, or, or the host of heaven notices our sins and brings them to the throne, and we're, you know, we, we, are, we are not worthy of justice, good heavens. We would die if justice were, were proclaimed over us. We're, we're, only, we're only people who are there by the mercy of Christ, by his sacrifice. And that's what John's vision is seeing. Jesus is standing with access to the Father at every side. While the four beasts are, are outside of that trinity uh, proclaiming his holiness. You understand? Now, Jesus is standing there um, worthy to open the scroll, standing the, uh, as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes because the Spirit of God is upon him. Everywhere... He goes, the Spirit of God goes. And so, we're going to talk more about that. So in verse 7, he went uh, and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. 
And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a, a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You are worthy. You are worthy because you obeyed the Father's wishes. You obeyed God's purposes of redemption. You were slain. And you ransomed so many people in the world. And you have made them, verse uh, uh, 10, you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. Some translations put a kingdom of priests. Um, that's not far off. It's just different wording. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. <laughs> it just, you know, uh, one thing you know you're going to be doing when you get to heaven. You're doing, doing a lot of singing, a lot of praising, a lot of falling down on your nose and worshipping. Um, in other words, you, you kind of need to get re used to my long worship services and my long sermons because that's what heaven's made up of. <clears throat> I, now, you, now I've got you worried, don't I? But there's a whole lot more going on in heaven. I mean, after all, you're never going to have to sleep when you get there. You know, so you got, I would say you got 24 hours, but my goodness, I don't know how long a day is in heaven. I'm not sure it gets dark. I don't know if whether it does or not. It's just, it just goes on forever, just eternity, you know? So, uh, you're going to be able to praise God for four or five hours and have another 40 hours to just go out and shine stars or do something, whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. Um, grooming the white horses, because you know there's a lot of white horses up there, and it takes a lot of grooming, I'll bet. I hope that's all it takes. But anyway, anyway, that's, that's a whole lot going on with white horses. And so you might be a groom stable. You know, you may be somebody who's working with the animals in heaven. I don't know. Um... Uh, I, I'm, I'm moving on uh, because these seven horns that the Lamb is standing there with in, in verse 6, standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven horns, uh, the horn, is, the horn is, is a symbolic language for power. It means that, that this person has power. And... Um, and it is, and so you look at, if you will, look with me in uh, Revelation 5 and uh, verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive. And he's receiving seven things. These are the seven horns. These are the, these are the words that describe his person, his power, what he's worthy to do. It is deity. What does deity own, you understand? Well, Look at these seven things. We're going to take uh, a few weeks and look at these seven things. God help us. Uh, because if, if the Lamb is worthy of these seven things, it just simply means that He's able to handle these seven things for all eternity. He is deity. He's God. And, uh, and I know there's some people around who, who, who tell me they're Christians, but they seem to have a problem with the deity of Jesus Christ, that he's not God, that he never said he was the son of God. Of course, he said that many times. But what, but what they're saying is, is he never meant that he was actually God. He's just the son of God. Now figure that one out, folks. God the Father has a son in heaven on his right hand, but he's not divine. How do you come up with that nonsense and read the Bible? I don't, I've never understood this because they're nice people. These people that I have met here in Catoosa County are nice folks, you know. Uh, they pray like I do, and, and they read the Word too, but they read it wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a trinity. There's a trinity. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I know this is kind of silly for me to have to say this to this crowd here uh, who are standing along the walls and, and out the doors, but I know it's a little silly for me to have to say this to you people, but I'm just saying, uh, you people on this side, listen up. Uh, that I'm just saying that the deal with this whole thing is that you have to understand this. The most important decision you will ever make in your life, friends, is the confession that Jesus Christ is God Almighty and has redeemed me by His cross. And I have life eternal because He rose from the dead never to die again. Now this is the most con important confession that you will ever come to in your lifetime. That's why I'm saying this to you yet one more time. <laughs> One more time. And so, the seven horns. Um, all of this is descriptive. These seven items are all descriptive of the contents, literally, of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10 says, you know, it's the starting of the Lord's Prayer. And I know you'll remember these verses as I say them to you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When the kingdom comes, in other words, he was saying, uh, what we'll be worried about is how to please God, not how to please us. You can tell when people have actually even come to Christ in this life because we're more concerned about how to please the Lord than we are just getting our way. Now, I know people get a little strange here. Uh, people can be Christians a long time and get just odd just odd because they get selfish or they get mean or they get snotty or, or they just want their way. And somebody has to go in like a pastor and just slap them silly, you know, in Jesus' name to help them get out of that box they just got themselves into. Now, sometimes it really works, you know. My mother was, my goodness sakes, oh, 60 maybe when she came to me and started crying about uh, my father having an affair. And, uh, and I'm not saying that he was a Christian man. I, I hope he, I think he got there. But I'm not saying he was at that time. And so I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm not making that point. But what I'm saying is, is my mother is the one who came to me. And, um, and I was taller than she was. And so she sort of laid her head on my shoulder and, and wept for a half hour. Very disconcerting when you're a teenager. <laughs> Your mother weeps over you like this regarding the, the rascally father that you've got and and so um i uh after a little while i had to say you, you know the group of friends that you have in this small town are 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 gossips and you've joined them for several years now yapping on the phone like you didn't have anything else to do in your house nor anybody else to care for including my father <laughs> who wanted meals at a certain time, who, was, who, who loved my mother's cooking, never showed up late for a meal <laughs> that I remember. And, and he loved her, uh, but he was a contractor, one of those kinds of people who was not very expressive, you know, when he should have been. And so uh, this group of gossips got her all worried about him and what was happening. So we kind of had to grab her by the hand and say, you know... <laughs> Are you in the kingdom of God or not? Do you pray in faith or not? Do you honestly think God would allow that man to walk away with some other woman? Do you honestly think this? Is this really what these people have done to you? Because that was exactly what they had done to her. They had taken all faith away from her. All desire for going to church. All desire for getting into the scriptures. Because it was so entertaining, you know, to talk about people behind their backs. <laughs> If you've never had a mother like that, boy, are you odd. And so anyway, what I'm saying to you is that you need to understand this, that the kingdom of God has all these characteristics about it. And, and so no, no, no wonder worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. You know, when you get through with those, friends, you got no time for you. you got no time left over for selfish little you. There's more to this life than living for you. What, am I going to say amen? 
This, this half of this, this building is mighty silent. I know that. We've got to get them stirred up. I'm just saying that, that there's, there is no, no better time for you to break away from you and, and be in the kingdom of God, knowing this, knowing this, that the kingdom of God is, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me talk to you for a few minutes. Um, let me talk to you for a few minutes about uh, power. Um, I, I, once in a while, I, I've had a fellow in the congregation who, who would say, I don't understand why he keeps referring to the Greek. Um, and, and it's because I can. And so I do. Um, it, actually, the, the book that we're reading here was not written initially in English. I, I know this is kind of silly to say this, but the truth of the matter is, some people don't know this. This Paul never spoke a word in English. He may still never have spoken a word in English. Um, but um, everything was in the Greek New Testament. Everything in the New Testament, it's Greek. Uh, Koine Greek, ancient Greek. Um, and so uh, the, the Greek word for that word is kind of important. I need to say this to you. It's dunamis. Um, from which, by the way, we get the word dynamite. Um, it's power. It's explosive power. There's another word for power, by the way. Another word for power. Uh, but that has to do with authority. Um, in, uh, in John chapter 1, uh, the scriptures are saying, John's writing to us that Jesus um, uh, was not accepted by those who were his people, but all those who had faith in him and received him. To them he gave power to become the sons of God. Remember that in John chapter 1? Well, the word there is, is not dunamis. It's the other word. It's, he gave them the authority. In other words, what that means is, is he opened the door for them. So that all we have to do is believe upon him, sincerely believe upon him, and let him change our lives so that we can be in his people, among his people. This is a different word from that. This is just the word flat, plain, power. Power. Interestingly enough, uh, that word power <laughs> um, is at work. When John 1 describes the fact that he is the creator of the world, uh, I, you, you understand that, don't you? That he was born in Bethlehem uh, at, 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 from, a, from a virgin and his stepfather Joseph, but he lived for eons and ages and eternity before that. <laughs> that was when he submitted to become this little lamb of God for the sacrifice of our sins. And he grew up in, in terms of earthly ministry. But before that, friends, before that, he was the creator of the worlds. He was there, you know, in Genesis when the Lord said, let us, plural, let us make man in our, plural, image. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit having that conversation, you understand. And, and so Elohim, the, the creation God, uh, all the way through Genesis 1 and part of Genesis 2, and it's used, my goodness, thousands of times after that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. The, the Hebrew name Elohim is plural. The im on the end is kind of simple. Uh, Hebrew nouns with an im on the end are plural. And so... Uh, the, the God who created us and created the worlds is its plural, the plural name. Now, it could be translated out of Hebrew into English as plural gods. You know, there are pagan gods in the world. That's the word Elohim. But the reason Israel wanted us to understand this is one God in multiples is because they always use a singular verb whenever he does something. And God created the world, you know. Uh, God is the God of love. God came and said to us, you know, that, that's always a, a, a plural noun with a singular verb. Very odd. Very odd. But what it's trying to describe for us is one God in multiple persons. Okay, you with me here so far? Didn't lose you, did I? Okay. So what I'm saying to you is you'd have to understand this. 
that he was there exercising dunamis power by his word to make worlds that did not exist before he said these words. Okay. You, could, you might describe it as the Big Bang Theory spoken by God. <laughs> All these worlds poof, came alive because God spoke. Now, in that light of power, let me say to you also, he is, this power is all-consuming. So why doesn't he just flat get his way? Not only in the kingdom of God, my goodness, uh, there are Christians that God doesn't seem to be able to control. You know. Now, there are Christians who keep going left instead of right, even though they think they're Christians, or they know they're Christians, and they probably are Christians, but they... They just have a will to be unwilling to will the will of God. See, that's the opposite of being willing to will <laughs> the will of God. I knew you were following. I just want to make sure you were awake. Some of you don't look like you're awake, but I think you should try. So when it comes to this understanding of the will of God, the will of God, um, He is in control. Why doesn't, he just, why doesn't He just take us and do something with us? I'm not saying that He doesn't. I'm saying he doesn't. There's lots of people I've talked to who were going their own way until the car hit them. <laughs> going their own way until COVID-19 struck. Going their own way until suddenly they lost the job they thought they were going to have forever. Going their own way until, you know, mama dies. Going their own way until daddy dies. Going their own way until somebody gets up from the dead and says to them, what are you doing wasting your life? Now, that's called God's power moving us back into his blessings, his kingdom, his help. Now, I know you all know all of this, but go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. There's an expression when it comes to his power in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 3, uh, look with me at, at uh, verse uh, 20. Um, And, okay, I'm finally there. Ephesians 3, um, look at verse 20. Now, to him, Paul is writing out of prison, saying to the Ephesian Christians, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Um, there is a power at work within us. And you know what that is, don't you? Uh, yes, it's the Lord. Let's be more specific. It is the Holy Spirit's way of doing business. He is within our minds. If you want to know where your spirit is, I'm kind of guessing it's somewhere between your ears. Maybe not the gray matter of the brain. Maybe not the hypothalamus. But it's somewhere in there. There is where the Spirit of God is. And, um, and so, that person is dealing with us in the power of God at work. That's why when he says to us, when you are praying, you know, he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Even what we're thinking, we're going to pray for. And we're not too sure that he's going to do it. And we're not too sure we have the faith for it. And we're not too sure it's not too big for him. <laughs> Paul is saying, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. You, 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 you touch him, it's like 220 volts. You know, that, that's what happens to people when they finally get a hold of the Lord. And he changes their lives. Even our stubbornness gets changed. I find this most amazing thing happens in men when they, they've been ornery and cranky and they don't like anybody, not God, not the dog, nobody. And then God gets hold of them. And suddenly they become this person who is a sweetheart. Boy, explain that. Suddenly they turn from being... Snotty Clyde, you know, into Sweet Joe. It's amazing what happens with them. Um, and so God's purpose is to come to us in power, but it's controlled power. It's meant to control us <laughs> when it comes to power. And you okay, okay. So how does he do this? Because I, I want to point back a minute in this chapter to the seven spirits of God. Um, it's best, best explained if you go with me back to Isaiah chapter 11. Um, I, I know you got up this morning saying to yourselves, you know, I just need to go and read Isaiah again. Um, or, uh, some of you will probably have to blow the dust off of Isaiah 
But I understand that. Uh, Old Testament prophets sometimes are tough to read. But I, listen, Isaiah is the Messianic prophet. He spoke more about the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, than any other prophet in the Bible. 66 chapters, I, I assume he spoke about something a whole lot, wouldn't you? It's in three pieces, by the way. And uh, three very organized pieces. And in Isaiah chapter 11, go with me to the first verse. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. As if this tree had been cut down, and now this little shoot is growing up from the roots underground. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch, very important word, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The branch. The branch, friends, and Jeremiah likes to talk about the branch as well, and, and other passages in the Old Testament. The branch is simply a prophecy that Jesus is going to come out of the roots of the family of Jesse. Who was Jesse's youngest son? David. King David. King David. And he became, he became the king of Israel by God's appointment. And the promise of the Messiah had to come through David's line. Um, and, so, and so, here we have out of the stump of Jesse, out of the remainders of the family of Jesse, comes this branch. What about this branch? How will he bear fruit? Keep reading verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now you get to kind of look and see the manifestations of the Spirit of God upon the Lord Jesus. I assume right now that this passage in, in Isaiah 11 is prophesying Jesus' earthly ministry as a man in Palestine doing the work of the Father. But read with me. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now it goes on to describe what he's doing, what will happen, and even what will happen in the, um, in the Messianic age. Um, but, but let me point you back to these, these uh, bearing, bearing fruit by the Spirit of God. There are seven items here um, that are the foretell fruit, foretell signs of the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. And if you think that's only six, you're not counting right. Uh, let me help you with that math. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is number seven, you understand? That's seven. But wait a minute, wasn't he also the spirit of wisdom and understanding? That's right, that's right. But each of these characteristics of the spirit of God were upon Jesus. And the Lord wants you and I to understand this, that the reason Jesus performed in the ministry that pleased the Father is because he gave up his own rights, he gave up his own glories. He just was a man with Jewish brown eyes, that's all. And, even, and Isaiah even tells us he was not very pretty. You wouldn't have been attracted to him because he was beautiful. That's not how God does things. You know. Um, and so here he, he proclaims that, that the Lord Jesus has these instruments of the Spirit of God, these ministries of the Spirit of God upon him. And, and you'll note in verse, two, uh, verse 3, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. In the fear of the Lord. That's right, because Proverbs 9 says to us, um, wisdom comes by the fear of the Lord. It's the number one wisdom principle of Proverbs. There are seven of them. Hard to believe, isn't it? Seven. But there are seven wisdom principles in the, in the book of Proverbs. And the very first one is um, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, the fear of the Lord. Jesus was, was extremely uh, happy with the fear of the Lord. And I know why. It's because when people finally get the common sense to surrender their life to God, finally lay down the shotgun, finally lay down the insult, finally lay down the sinfulness, finally lay down the silliness that we are born into. When we finally lay that down, <laughs> We have come to this place, come to surrender our lives to the Lord, 
it always says, it always says, somewhere along the line, this person came into the fear of the Lord. Somewhere along the line. Now I realize there are more uh, arrogant people on the face of the earth than one can count. I understand that. But folks, even stupid people can surrender to Christ. Even people who are spiritual bricks can come to a place of surrender. And it's not because they get smart. It is because the Spirit of God just never gives up. He just never quits talking. They go to church and God talks to them. They leave church and God talks to them. They stay away from church because, yes, God talks to them. And sadly, what they find out is even washing the car and not trying to go to church, God talks to them. Amazing that. Amazing that. He doesn't throw them away because they're choosing badly or doing wrong things. Um, it, that's a shame. It will delay the progress, but God never quits. Once he starts, once he starts, he doesn't quit. So if he has started with you, and you're listening now because, well, you don't go to church much, and if any, and you haven't really, really decided to go to this church either, thank you anyway, you keep waiting for me to ask for an offering, don't you? You keep those cars and letters coming in. Uh, but I'm not saying I'm not going to do that yet. Um, but the Spirit of God will just keep talking to you. Just keep saying what the Lord wants you to hear until one day, one day, you will come. And when you do come, those of you who are on your way, you will look back over the last years and kick yourself hard for denying what you should have been doing all along. It's just that good. <laughs> it really is just that good. So the Spirit of God comes, and as you know, the Spirit of the Lord that was resting upon Jesus, He can bring wisdom and understanding and counsel and light and knowledge and, praise God, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. All arrogance gets up and walks when a person has finally come to Christ. I realize it may not, I realize we may, we may do our own selves in with our mouth and our arrogance and our attitudes and we're Christians nonetheless. I know that. But for you to come to the Lord, the fear of the Lord is, I'm shutting up and I'm listening. And that's how the Holy Spirit's voice finally gets to you. And finally says to you one fine day, isn't this the time when you want to open up to God? Isn't this the time? Isn't this the time? I, I was um, here on, at the church on a Saturday evening praying uh, or doing whatever uh, piously uh, preacherish things I should be doing on Saturday nights. And there I was. Um, and, uh, and as I was praying for the congregation, praying about the Sunday morning message, <laughs> because uh, most Sunday mornings, I need a lot of prayer about Sunday morning messages. And so... Uh, the Lord said to me, very specifically, um, tomorrow in the service, somebody's going to come to Christ. Didn't tell me who. Wouldn't have made any difference if he told me who. I didn't know them anyway. But anyway, uh, um, and I thought, well, maybe somebody in my congregation, perhaps, would just suddenly re realizes they didn't know the Lord and that they would come to him. And so Sunday morning, I was really here looking for them. Um, and um, people would come in and sit down, and I thought, well, I, I think they're Christians. You know, they've always been Christians, I think. And, and, um, or somebody else would come in, and, well, they, they came to Christ a couple years ago in our church, and I, I said, that can't be it. And finally, our time starting at that time was 11, and, and the clock was ticking, and finally it got too close to 11, almost at 11. And, um, and in walks... Two ladies, um, a mom and a daughter, and a daughter in, in high school still at that time. And they had been in the church before. I had seen them at a music program uh, for several times through the years. Uh, but they had never heard the gospel preached in those particular services as far as my preaching goes. And so in they walk. I, said, I realized then, aha, <laughs> aha. <laughs> the Lord knows that they're going to come to Christ today. Well, it just made preaching Christ a great joy. Because I knew something was going to happen, you know. I just knew it. 
And, um, and so at the invitation time, uh, they came down the aisle crying and very emotional. And if you had just known these people, you would know they, they're not exactly emotional. But um, the Lord broke through. He got them into church and began to talk to them. And lo and behold, um, the mom told me later that she got up that morning with a realization, I've got to go to church. I've got to go somewhere to church. And she thought about a church, but it wasn't our church. <laughs> So she drove, out, drove along and got close to this church and said, oh, oh well, <laughs> and drove in here. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll take it. And so God brought... Now, what I'm saying to you is, listen, uh, these seven spirits of God that are upon the Lord Jesus and upon Him now in terms of how Revelation teaches it, that spirit of God is present in the church as well as upon Jesus. Those seven spirits of God that have gone out into all the world. And they're here. He's here. That person of the Spirit of God is here. And his effect and his influence is here. I want to talk with you um, more about this. Um, it, it just, just let me briefly say this to you. Um, seven horns upon the Lord Jesus depicts his power. Power to do whatever he wants but with God's limitations. Now, you know the Lord. He, my goodness, um, He designs the church to operate on two steel rails. He designs the church to function in this world on these two rails. One is faith and the other is the Word of God. Both have got to be implemented in the life of the church and in the life of a Christian. Faith and the Word of God. God's power is so powerful that it's like a locomotive pulling a hundred trains, a hundred cars, I mean, on a train. And, um, and, and yet, if you put that huge locomotive in this parking lot or out on the street, uh, all the power it has, it would bury itself in a hole. It, it, it too much power. It cannot be controlled power. So the way the Lord controls the power of God among us is He puts it on these two rails. Faith and the Word of God. I don't want an encounter with God. Well, don't worry. If you're not in the Word of God and you're never in church and you don't want anything to do with faith, you don't have the slightest chance of getting there from here. Except you might just be like um, um, John Newton who wrote uh, Amazing Grace a couple centuries ago, by the way. And, um, and he was a captain of a, of a ship for carting slaves. He saw many a slave lost in that process. Um, they went through a terrible storm. And in his last days of being on that road to hell, um, they went through a terrible storm at sea. And he, he literally had done this before, but he did it again. He got on his knees and he pled to the Lord, if you will just save us, all of us from this storm, I will serve you. When we get back to London, I will serve you. And that's exactly what he did. His life was spared. He became a pastor of, a, of an Anglican church and eventually of an Anglican church in London where he became famous for his songwriting abilities. And he wrote, of course, as you know, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The power of God is what opens the kingdom to his people. The power of God is what we count upon when we say to the Lord, take Satan and all his hosts out of my way. Put them out of my home, out of my life, out of my children, out of my church. I need the power of God to do that. And the more we pray, as Paul says, the more we understand the abundance of the power that we are addressing in our prayer life. You also are praying that way. Sometimes with no faith. Sometimes in the reality that I'm not so sure God's big enough to do it. 
But the truth of the matter is, of course, of course, that's the reason the Lord surprises us a lot. Because He has the power <laughs> to do what He wants to do. Each and every time when you are, and I access God by His Holy Spirit, miracles can occur. Wonderful things can occur. I don't expect them sometimes. Maybe you don't expect them very much in your life. Shame on us. But nonetheless, nonetheless, worthy are you, O Lord. That's what Revelation says. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. These are the seven horns. These are the realities of the kingdom that has come to us through Christ. What do you need to do about that? Well, you need to come to this place where you are willing for the power of God to be shown through you. That's not always easy, by the way. But sometimes we, sometimes we have friends who discourage us in terms of trusting the power of God, of wanting to surrender our lives to Him by the power of God. Sometimes we have people around us who are just not open to that. Who don't want us to be doing that. And, um, and, and so I'm just saying, you, you may need to say, Lord, I need the power in my life to differentiate those people who ought to be in my life. To put the ones who need to be somewhere else out there and the ones who need to be close to me in here. I need the power of God to d tell the difference between the people that I spend time with. Sometimes, you know, we're not very smart about that. Sometimes we realize that we want our own way, but we don't have the power to do anything about that. So the primary thing that we should be doing is saying, Lord, I surrender to you. I want the power of Christ in my life to live like you want me to live. I want to will the will of Christ. I want to be willing to will the will of Christ. And that's going to take the power of God. I've had a lot of people through the years tell me they didn't think they were worthy. They didn't think they could do this. They, they didn't think they were ready. They didn't think, whatever, you know. I'm waiting for a full moon on a Wednesday. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for a new job to make millions so that I can finally give up all my old things and, uh, and, and now that I've got everything I want, and then I'll go back to God. Just nonsense, absolutely nonsense. One fellow told me, I'm a, you understand, I'm a, I'm a broker for cattle. I buy cattle, and, and my job is to lie to farmers so I can buy their cattle for the less than they want to sell them. I said, how well does that work with TV telling them every day what, what cattle are worth? You know, how do you, and he said, oh, I just take that and I say, that's ridiculous. That's a lie. So you're actually saying to farmers, you quit believing the truth. It's a lie. Believe my lie because it's not the truth, right? That's what you're saying? He said, that's it. <laughs> That's it. And, they, and I'm good at this job. <laughs> I've still got this job after 15 years because I'm good at lying to farmers. He was kind of a big guy, looked like a farmer, and they trust him. They just trust him. He puts on his, you know, uh, Farm Bureau hat, and, and he looks like everybody else there at the granary. And he's lying to farmers all the time. He says, you can't expect me to come to Christ because if I come to Christ, I'm going to lose my job. So, so you already know don't you, Ben? You already know that the Lord's going to demand you tell the truth and not lie for a living. And he said, well, of course I know that. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Everybody knows that. And I said, how long are you going to have this job, you think, before you can come to Christ? Well, I, retirement's about another 30 years away. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I can come to Christ anytime soon. <laughs> and I said, you know, this conversation's getting silly. Do you honestly think you've got another 35 years? Seriously? You know what's going to happen. The same people who love to pay you because you're a good liar are going to start lying to you because they got somebody younger they can employ who won't have to take, you know, retirement on them. You understand that's how that works, don't you? If you lie for a living, you're going to get lied to somewhere along the line. They're going to cut you right off. And he said, oh, well, yeah, I guess so back to surrender you don't know what you're asking me I wonder how I wound up in your living room today 
I got another 50 people I could have gone to that I like a lot better than you. But here I am. I wonder what you think God's purposes are, for, are here. Do you think maybe the timing of the Lord is not your timing? That God will do something miraculous for you if you trust Him? That He will give you a better job at which you do not have to lie? That you don't have to work on Sundays? You don't have to work on those days when you can take your family to church? Don't you think God's big enough to do that? And his answer was, never thought about it. <laughs> don't, know, don't know. I don't know if that's true. Well, I've never lied to you one time. I've known you, I've known you a full 60 minutes here. Never lied to you yet. You trust God now. You do what's in front of you to do now. And God will honor that faith. But you probably will not keep this job. You're right. You're right. He did. He did, folks. Eventually. It took a couple hours, you know, of us talking back and forth like this. Eventually, he came to a place that he wanted to be all along. He just couldn't figure out how to get there. Because lying for a living is no fun. No fun. I've been in sales. And I have refused to lie to people. And I lost some sales. But the guys who were selling right alongside me, who were busy lying as much as they could, I tell you, they were in trouble every time they turned around. Somebody was calling them on what they said was not true. Somebody, they blamed me for that because they said, You're, you, you probably have prayed for us to get in trouble about lying. For, you know, um, I'm not saying I didn't. <laughs> I'm not saying I did. Nonetheless, nonetheless, what's your choice? What's your choice? You've got one. That's the power of God. You've got a choice. God has not knocked you off your feet. He has not pulled you away from anything you loved. He doesn't operate that way. He just says, here's your choice. And because God's powerful, you can make that choice and it will be important now. Not ten years from now. Not next year. Now. It will be important now. Let me give that invitation to you. Let's pray. We know, Lord, that you carry with you these seven spiritual realities and the power of God enables you to say to us, if you trust me, I will change your life. If you trust me, I will change your life. And we're praying for that right now. The Lordship of Christ over us. We're just praying together. Lord, I, I'm asking you to come into my life in every which way is possible to come into a person's life. Go ahead and pray that with me if you'd like, under your breath or in your own mind. Or get on your knees and pray it if, if you mean it. Whatever you want to do. We want the power of God in our life. We want what Satan is saying to us to just simply be thrown out of our households, thrown out of our lives. And we want, we want what the Spirit of God can do in our life right now. And so we trust you for what you can do, what only you can do. And so worthy is the Lamb because he was slain. Worthy is the Lamb because he was slain. And so he has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And Lord, we lay claim to that for us. Cleanse us from sin. We open our life to you now. We surrender to you, Lord God, because of Jesus Christ dying for us on the cross, rising from the dead so that we would never die again. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we trust you now. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen.